Good evening, Church History friends. My name is Barb Walden, and it's a joy to welcome you to the Church History Without Boundaries Autumn Lecture Series. This evening, we will hear the third lecture in our eight-part lecture series, Exploring the Global History of Community of Christ. Thank you for joining us this evening as we hear about the history of Community of Christ in southeastern Nigeria from our guest historian, Dima Hurlbut. It's an annual tradition for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation to take, take to the road to explore church history on a bus tour every autumn. But this year, due to COVID-19, we are staying close to home for everyone's safety. Some could say we are keeping with a long held tradition within our faith community's history of reorganizing when needed. So this year, we are leaving the motor coach behind and instead, choosing to travel the world through the pages of church history. Even better, a number of fantastic historians will be joining us in donating their time and knowledge to exploring Community of Christ's global roots every Thursday. Now our lecture series is made possible not only because of your generous donations to the Historic Sites Foundation, but also because of our talented co-hosts, Peter Smith and Megan Reed. Peter is a board member for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and co-host to our annual Historic Sites bus tour. He's literally traveled the world sharing church history with hundreds of guests, and we are so lucky to have him here tonight. Our second co-host is Megan Reed. Megan is working on her master's degree at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. She's also serving as a student in the Alma Blair Internship Program, a young adult program at the historic sites that you all help support. Peter and Megan are the brains behind our online educational programs, and we wouldn't be able to manage the lecture series without them. So thank you both. Our Church History Without Boundaries lecture series is not only a great way to spend an autumn evening learning church history, it's also a benefit for the Community of Christ Historic Sites. You see, the sites are temporarily closed for public safety due to COVID-19. However, the preservation and maintenance needs of the historic sites continue on. Your donations are especially critical as the loss of revenue from site preservation fees and museum store sales this year is unprecedented. As we continue to work towards the goal of becoming self-sustaining, your donations from tonight's lecture will go a long way towards supporting and preserving Community of Christ historic sites for future generations. Megan um, has dropped a link into the chat box for anyone who is interested in making an online donation tonight. Uh, she has also dropped a address for those of you who prefer to mail in your donations. Thank you, Megan. Now, the last person I want to introduce you tonight is our evening guest speaker, Dima Hurlbut. Dima earned a PhD in African history from Boston University. He was the 2018-2019 Graduate Research Fellow in Mormon Studies at the Tanner Humanities Center at the University of Utah. His research has appeared in the International Journal of African Historical Studies, the Journal of Mormon History, and religions. Tonight, Dima will take a look at the story of Community of Christ in southeastern Nigeria, specifically during the 1960s and 70s period. He will explore why Nigerians wanted to become members of the Community of Christ and the impact that the global expansion of the church had on its theology and mission policy. So thank you for joining us, Dima. I'll hand the microphone over to you as we are all looking forward to hearing your thoughts on church history in Nigeria. Thanks, Barb. And I'd also like to thank Peter, Megan, and David Howlett for inviting me to give this talk. I plan to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then I look forward to fielding your questions. In late October 1962, an unexpected letter from abroad landed on the desk of Maurice Draper the second counselor of the First Presidency of the RLDS Church. Dinah Tommy, 
the signatory of the letter, had written on behalf of 13 congregations located in Abak, a town in southeastern Nigeria, to request affiliation with your church group in America. She prayed for the reorganized church to send some American missionaries, or spirit-filled missionaries, and a few copies of reference Bibles and textbooks. After reading Tommy's letter, Draper forwarded her plea for support to the Council of the Twelve Apostles, but the Council simply returned the letter to him with a brief note that read, thanks for letting us see this. Without any guidance from the church officials responsible for adjudicating church expansion, Draper made the decision to reply to Tommy's vague letter. In his response, dated 29 November 1962, he stated that her request provided insufficient information. The reorganization, he said, wanted a brief description of your movement, including a history of its origins and experience to date, a list of its officers, and a statement of your basic doctrine before it could make a judgment on the matter. Since the church had been organized in the mid-19th century, it had not officially engaged in any missionary activities in Africa, but this all changed with the arrival of Tommy's letter. In this talk, I will explore not only why Christian congregations in southeastern Nigeria were drawn to the reorganized church, but also the significance of the RLDS fact-finding missions in southeastern Nigeria during the 1960s and 1970s for the church in the late 20th century. I'll make two arguments. First, I'll argue that the members of Tommy's church and other Nigerians living in the ethic-speaking region of southeastern Nigeria were drawn to the RLDS church primarily by a desire to improve their access to resources. And second, I'll contend that the entry of the reorganized church into southeastern Nigeria showcases the church, church's shift towards the Protestant mainstream that accompanied the unprecedented international expansion of the RLDS church into the non-Western world during the 1960s. Unlike early RLDS missionary strategies, which embraced a traditional conception of proselytization, RLDS church leaders in the 1960s and 1970s wanted to develop a mission strategy that would allow the church to contribute to the long-term development of the post-colonial Nigerian nation. So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about who these Nigerians were and why they wanted to become Mormons, a term I use following Crystal Van Nell to denote any group or person that embraces the Book of Mormon as scripture. The letters that Draper received in his response, in response to his request for more information about the history and beliefs of Tommy's church enable historians to contextualize this nascent indigenous religious movement within the broader religious environment of southeastern Nigeria. The Church of Jesus Christ, as Tommy's church group turned out to be called, was founded by Goberi Det, an ethics speaker, in 1954. Idet was had been called to serve God at a very young age, but uh, he apparently resisted the divine call to preach the gospel out of fear that he would be unable to lead and preach the word of God effectively. When he finally embraced the call to serve at the age of 21 after prayer and fasting, Ida began to establish his indigenous church through house-to-house -house evangelism. By going door-to-door -door and speaking with individuals in their homes about the gospel, he built up a following of people of like calling and faith. With their assistance as workers and preachers, Ida organized churches in more than 30 towns around Abba. Edet's indigenous religious movement espoused a diverse mixture of doctrinal statements. Some of these doctrines were rather uncontroversial from a Christian standpoint. Edet indicated this church believed in one true and living God, three persons in one, namely the God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, sanctification, the existence of heaven and hell, and that the Holy Bible is the inspired word of God. His indigenous church, however, also possessed many Pentecostal characteristics. 
Not only were members of Edet's indigenous church baptized with the Holy Ghost, but they also spoke in tongues. Edet even claimed that he believed in the practice of divine healing, which was common among Pentecostals. Some of Edet's other doctrinal statements were also compatible with longstanding beliefs and practices of Mormonism, including baptism by immersion, tithing, and the importance of abstaining from all kinds of alcoholic drinks and tobacco. Edith's eclectic Christian doctrines and practices reflected the diversity of the religious environment of southeastern Nigeria. Over the course of the 20th century, southeastern Nigeria became known for its intense religious competition and innovation. By 1968, Sociologist David Barrett had reported in his encyclopedic study of 6,000 churches across the African continent that the Southeast had the densest concentration of African independent churches on the entire African continent. Barrett concluded that there were more than 50 denominations with more than 250 congregations within a five mile radius of Abak alone. Edet's church had been born out of this confused, competitive, and divisive ecclesial situation. Edet was motivated to affiliate the Church of Jesus Christ with the reorganized church by his desire to gain access to resources that would allow him to be a more effective church leader. His letter to the First Presidency, dated 12 December 1962, included an appeal for financial support one gospel car for our use in the whole field, and reference Bibles and your doctrinal books and other missionary textbooks and papers. These and similar requests were reiterated in subsequent letters and welcome addresses for the RLDS missionaries that visited his community. The most important request from Edet, however, was a burning desire to pursue advanced education in the United States. On 19 March, 1963, Edet begged church leaders to allow him, and I quote, to apply for a scholarship in one of your Bible theological seminaries or Bible colleges in America. He believed that he could not effectively lead his congregation and command authority without advancing himself educationally, since, and I quote, there is nothing that lowers a minister of the gospel in the respect and affection of his audience so quickly and so openly than to be guilty of gross breaches in the English language. From the early days of colonialism, Nigerians treated Western education not only as an important source of prestige and respect within their local communities, but also as the key to personal betterment. One of the most effective ways to gain access to this type of education was to join a Western church. As a leader of a poor church whose congregants did not speak English, he did adapted this long-standing social survival strategy in southeastern Nigeria to the context of the post-colonial environment by appealing to an American church for support. When Edet appealed to an American church for assistance, he placed himself within a longer historical trajectory. The practice of using churches to gain access to basic resources was intimately bound up in the economic history of southeastern Nigeria, which has been defined by the extraction of mass commodities, including slaves, palm oil, and petroleum for the global economy. This, excuse me, this extractive economy prevented any serious development from occurring within the southeast over the past 150 years. Indeed, one Nigerian politician famously quipped that the southeastern part of the country was nothing short of a national uh, necessary, a necessary sacrifice for the betterment of the country. Within this larger economic context, as historian Caroline Afeka Moller has demonstrated, Nigerians who were frustrated by the acute competition for scarce material resources and the exclusion from the rewards of political and economic power turned to the only plentiful resource that could facilitate social advancement and a reasonable standard of living, religion. 
The letters that Maurice Straper, the second counselor of the First Presidency, received in response to his request for more information about the Church of Jesus Christ between December 1962 and March 1963 convinced him and other church leaders of the need to investigate the Nigerian situation further. And on April 22nd, 1963, the First Presidency asked Cecil Ettinger, a church apostle based in Birmingham, to visit Nigeria in order to make an assessment of the EDET situation. Ettinger arrived in Nigeria on the 1st of August, 1962, for a three-week visit. And during his visit to EDET's village, Ikat Okumfang, the village chiefs had a meeting in which they voted to disassociate themselves from other religious groups in order to wait for the time when we could send missionaries so they could associate themselves with us. They also offered to give the reorganized church a tract of land to build a church, a mission house, and any other necessary buildings. Ettinger then spent the remainder of his three-week visit survey mission discussing the opportunities and challenges facing the reorganized church with American diplomats and Nigerian government officials in Enugu and then in Lagos. While many of the Nigerian civil servants that he spoke to were unwilling to commit themselves to helping the RLDS church establish a mission in Nigeria until the church submitted a definite plan for entry and work, Members of the American diplomatic corps, including Robert P. Smith, the principal officer at the U.S. consulate in Enugu between 1962 and 1965, and Peter Tarnoff, a political officer at the U.S. embassy in Lagos from 1962 to 1965, encouraged the reorganization to assist in providing much needed educational services throughout Nigeria. When Ettinger returned to England on the 17th of August, 1963, he produced a report for the First Presidency about his brief survey trip, in which he made two recommendations that would shape the contours of the RLDS ministry in southeastern Nigeria. First, Ettinger recommended that the reorganized church needed to acquire funds to bring Edet, the leader of the Church of Jesus Christ, to Graceland College. Edet, Ettinger reported, is the kind of man we can build upon. If he were to come to Graceland, he could prepare himself for greater potential service. Ettinger also recommended that our, the RLDS missionary endeavor in southern Nigeria should focus on development work. He observed that Nigeria could greatly benefit from the assistance of foreign teachers, agricultural advisors, and nurses, a point which was reiterated in the letter to Apostles Percy Farrow and Duane Cooey, who were in the process of preparing for their own investigative trip to Nigeria in October of 1963. I would advise before you start out, Ettinger wrote, finding out all you can about United States governmental aid programs to underdeveloped countries. I know there's an aid program in education and in medicine where private organizations such as churches can use this aid in order to set up schools, hospitals. In November 1963, Farrow and Kui made a follow-up trip to Nigeria and their experience in southeastern Nigeria mirrored Ettinger's. During their nine-day stay in Edet's village, he organized a conference that presented Pharaoh and Kui with an opportunity to meet congregants from all around southeastern Nigeria. And after finishing up in Edet's village, Pharaoh and Kui traveled to Enugu and talked with many of the same government officials that Ettinger had spoken with during his own visit, including Robert P. Smith and the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Education for Eastern Nigeria. Excuse me. After their trip, Farrell Kui reaffirmed Ettinger's recommendation to bring Edet to Graceland College for advanced studies. The first step, which is absolutely essential to the establishment of such a mission, wrote Farrell and Kui in their official report, is to bring Reverend Edet to America on a program which will further his academic education. We believe, Farrell and Kui continued, that if Reverend Edet attends Graceland College, that for practical experience in ministry, after he is baptized and ordained, he might well be placed under the leadership of the state president, 
cooperating with the college and giving him experience in the congregations of the stake. Education in the United States would not only provide Edet with the tools to lift his people further from their present status, religiously, economically, or culturally, they wrote, but it would also give him the opportunity to understand how the church was organized and structured by bringing him to the Midwest, the center of the RLDS faith. After Pharaoh and Cooley submitted their recommendations in December 1963, church leaders formulated a plan to bring Edet to the United States. When he was at Graceland College, Edet would pursue a program of general education that would solidify his training as a teacher. Edet's educational agenda was influenced by the reorganized church's desire to, to contribute to the long-term development of Nigeria. I think we need to keep in mind the fact that this man is a teacher, wrote Clifford Cole, president of the Council of Twelve. His interests lie in this direction, and the men of the Council of Twelve who have visited Nigeria all emphasized the importance of educational work in Nigeria. Following Edet's two years of training in the United States, the reorganized church officially announced on 15 November 1965 that missionary work would be commenced in southeastern Nigeria. What was notable about the declaration approved by the First Presidency, the Council of Twelve and the presiding bishopric, however, was the absence of a clearly articulated focus on proselytization. Heeding the recommendations of Enger, Pharaoh, and Kui, church leaders declared that the reorganized church would instead focus on, and I quote, social projects such as agricultural, educational, and medical services. When Edet returned to Nigeria towards the beginning of 1966, he was accompanied by Merle Guthrie, an RLDS high priest assigned to begin work in Nigeria. Like Ettinger, Pharaoh, and Kui before him, Guthrie came to the conclusion that the reorganized church should focus on development work. During his brief visit to Edet's village, he observed that Edet's congregations wanted, and I quote, help for their children. They need health care, as well as proper nourishment and education. Apart from baptizing RLDS adherents and ordaining local leaders, he suggested that the RLDS church needed to explore the possibility of establishing a school, preferably a trade school, and a children's outpatient clinic. The interest that RLDS church leaders like Guthrie showed in contributing to the development of the post-colonial Nigerian nation exposed the shift that the RLDS church made towards the Protestant mainstream. RLDS church leaders worried that non-Western peoples would not be able to comprehend the nuanced differences between Mormons and mainline Christians. So they tried to develop a clear message that would appeal to church members of many different backgrounds and cultures, which included an emphasis on the social gospel. The shift also involved a subtle theological transformation as well. The goal of evangelism was no longer to introduce God to other peoples, but rather to illuminate the presence of God. We are not bringing God to some culture, wrote RLDS Apostle Charles Neff, reflecting on the RLDS Church's ministry in Africa. God is already there, and God is manifested in several different ways. Missionary work is to help people become sensitive to those manifestations of this higher power. Mission as Christian presence was an idea popularized in the middle of the 20th century by Anglican Church Missionary Society Secretary General Max Warren, who, paraphrasing a passage of Acts, famously wrote, our first task in approaching another people, another culture, another religion, is to take off our shoes for the place we are approaching is holy. Else we may find ourselves treading on men's dreams, more serious still, we may forget that God was here before our arrival. Despite its announcement that southeastern Nigeria had been open for missionary work, the reorganized church's plan to lift Edet and his congregations to higher heights would have to wait. 
For the remainder of the 1960s, the reorganization experienced setbacks that prevented the church from initiating its work in the Southeast. After Guthrie returned from his brief trip to Edette's village in 1966, he and another RLDS missionary, excuse me, assigned to begin work in southeastern Nigeria named Bob Seeley were unable to acquire long-term visas. The reorganized church then had to postpone its work following the outbreak of the Nigerian Civil War. Although the circumstances of the war prevented the church from sending missionaries, church leaders did not abandon their Nigerian congregations. The reorganized church's engagement with Edet over the course of the Biafran War demonstrates not only that the success of the reorganization in southeastern Nigeria was linked to the way it merged religious beliefs and practices that appealed to Edet and his congregants with access to international resources that local churches lacked, but also that church leaders were serious about putting their new humanitarian impulse into practice. While the doctrinal statements that Edet articulated to Draper in his 1962 letter demonstrate that he and his congregants were inclined towards Pentecostal religious practices, the wartime environment appears to have accentuated the Pentecostal dimensions of Edet's church. In 1969, Edet described the rituals and practices that members of his congregations deployed to ensure their good health and security in the tumultuous environment of the besieged Southeast in a batch of religious testimonies that he mailed to Norman Ruoff, the editor of Herald House, the publishing division of the RLDS Church. A great instrumentality in winning more people to God Edet wrote on the 5th of November, 1969, has been our monthly prayer and fasting programs in all the churches. He then went on to detail all the ways in which Nigerian Mormons had been divinely healed, saved, and delivered from the bondage of Satan, slavery, and servitudes. In May, Albert Umo, a preacher in the reorganized church, lost not only his voice, but also his ability to swallow after he was bewitched and then attacked by a witch doctor. But according to Edet, he had been healed within a space of nine hours after the congregation prayed and anointed him with oil. In August, Justina uh, Edet, Gobert's wife, uh, Gobert's wife came down with a bad case of pneumonia. After Edet prayed in tears to God and anointed her with oil, however, she was miraculously healed in less than one hour. The same month, a sickly three-year-old boy from Obiongpong, a village outside of Uyo, was miraculously healed through prayer and fasting. And then in September, the day after a sick man named Basi Usoro had to be transported to a prayer session at Edet's village on a bicycle, he was able to transport himself to Calaba without any mechanical assistance. In October, a young man named Udo Akpan prayed and fasted for seven days at the reorganized church's headquarters in order to achieve complete victory over evil spirits which had been tormenting and oppressing him for several years. Systematic prayer, fasting, anointing the sick with oil, all of these rituals became commonplace in the Southeast following the rise of charismatic prayer houses during the 1960s. Although Pentecostal activities in the region can be traced back to the 1910s with the emergence of the Garrick Braid movement, Pentecostalism remained relatively insignificant in the region during the colonial period due to the stranglehold of the Catholic, Anglican, and, and, and Presbyterian churches. Before 1967, for instance, there were only around 19 prayer houses in southeastern Nigeria. By the end of the, 19, uh, by the, end of the Nigerian Civil War, however, there were almost 150 different prayer houses active in the Southeast. The uncontrollable momentum of prayer houses during the Nigerian Civil War is inextricably linked 
to the deterioration of Nigerian society. Pentecostal religious practices and rituals promise to provide Nigerians with solutions to everyday problems and ward off evil and danger. That is, those religious practices that were concerned with explanation, prediction, and control. As historian Sam Daly has argued, the offerings turned to new devotional practices to grapple with the circumstances in which they found themselves. And while some turned back towards faith healers and ritualists who practiced divination or magic, others embraced Pentecostal strains of Christianity that emerged in the form of prayer houses. And the emergence of an RLDS prayer house occurred because Idet and his congregations were not immune from the negative effects of the war. In 1968, Idet repeatedly described the terrible sufferings that he and his fellow Mormons experienced over the course of the first half of the war when they were cut off from the outside world. In August, Idet wrote to Aliyah Khoury, apostle to Africa and member of the Council of Twelve, that his congregants suffered from extreme fear of one's uncertainty of his existence. Starvation, malnutrition, hunger, diseases, illness, and death. In October, Idet similarly told the editor of Herald House that we starved almost to death. Oftentimes, we could not find foodstuffs to buy, food became very scarce, real famine began. Confronted with the same problems as their neighbors, RLDS congregants turned to the same remedies that their, Niger that their fellow Nigerians did, prayer and fasting. The archival record doesn't indicate that the reorganized church ever censured the Nigerian congregations for Pentecostalizing their Mormon faith. Instead, church leaders always seem to insist that Nigerian congregations should express their religion in a way that conformed with the needs of local culture and customs. In November 1968, for instance, excuse me, Edet sent a draft of a 25 chapter after a handbook that he had composed for Nigerian Sunday school teachers to Enger and Kuri for their comments on his tract. I'm very pleased to see you write the tracts that you feel are needed by your people. This is much better than sending American tracts for distribution, wrote Kuri in his response to Dent. In all parts of the world, needs differ, he continued. I'm quite aware that at many points, the needs of Nigerians are considerably different from what they are in the United States. Therefore, most of the time, I cannot be sure of your needs. It would seem to us that to take RLDS materials and adapt them to the specific needs of specific church leaders in Nigeria would be better for those leaders than to expect them to do their own adaptations from materials that were prepared by Protestants many years ago. Whenever he did, deployed terminology that was not part of the reorganized church's institutional vocabulary in his guidebook, such as training union, women's missionary council, Sunday school, and superintendent, Kuri did not immediately force Adet to change the terms to standardized language. Instead, he asked Adet whether these terms were well established and understood in Nigeria. In doing so, RLDS church leaders displayed a deference towards local leadership and a willingness to be flexible in their efforts to translate the RLDS message and its structures across diverse cultures. In the competitive religious environment of southeastern Nigeria, churches needed to be able to adapt to new trends within worship or they risked the possibility of losing their congregants to other religious organizations that were willing to adapt themselves to meet the demands of religious consumers. While the Pentecostalization of the reorganized church and its ability to adapt itself to local culture may explain why the church didn't lose congregants during the Civil War period, it doesn't really explain why some ethnic speaking Nigerians would choose to join the reorganized church over some other religious group, since Nigerians throughout the Southeast could access these rituals and practices through any Pentecostal prayer house or indigenous ritualist. 
The expansion of the reorganized church into southeastern Nigeria over the course of the Civil War then was facilitated by the reality that the RLBS church could provide its congregants with access to basic resources while the indigenous churches without an international affiliate could not. Between 1969 and the end of the Nigerian Civil War in 1970, the RLDS Church sent thousands of dollars to Ided and his congregants for humanitarian relief. In January 1969, the Joint Council sent $1,000 for free distribution to the poor and needy people, for feeding, for clothing, health, and shelter. In response to this generous support, Edet organized a relief distribution committee so his congregants could decide how the money could be used most effectively. Following the formation of this committee in 196, Feb of 1969, church leaders sent Edet another $2,000 from the Oblation Fund for the purchase of new yam seeds and other crops for cultivation. In the same month, Students at Graceland raised $50 for the relief of starvation, hunger, disease, and death among the suffering masses of the people of Nigeria. In June of 1969, the Joint Council donated another $1,000 for food, clothing, health, and shelter. And in Feb of 1970, Idet wrote to Kuri in order to request more money for more yam seedlings and other crops, because the things planted last year through relief funds could not and cannot meet our daily needs, no matter the size of each man's farm. In response to Idet's request, church leaders sent another $1,000 from the Oblation Fund for agricultural goods, as well as an extra $1,000 from the presiding bishopric. The reorganized church's concern for the well-being of its Nigerian congregants brought other indigenous congregations into the Mormon fold. In October of 1969, Edet reported to the editor of Herald House that the reorganized church's acts of human kindness, humanitarianism, humanitarianism benevolence, philanthropy, love, and total concern for the welfare of Nigeria resulted in the conversion of two congregations with a large number of people. Sunday Charlie Akpan, who succeeded Edet as leader of the reorganized church in Nigeria in the 1970s, similarly reported in his oral history that many people joined during the Civil War period because of the untold care of the RLDS church for its Nigerian congregations. During the war, recalled Akpan in 1997, some money was sent to help poor people. So when that sort of thing was shared and mentioned that it is the church sending the money here, then the question, the big question was, how can the church who does not see us, who does not know any of us, send such things? It must be a good church. In short, Nigerians living in the ethnic speaking region of the Southeast were primarily drawn to the reorganized church by the access that this religious institution provided to resources that other local churches could not. Following the end of the Nigerian Civil War, the RLDS Church, through Charles Neff and the RLDS nonprofit Mission Outreach International, sponsored an Australian nurse named Sue Selden to work in a maternal health clinic in Opobo in southeastern Nigeria. The medical mission ultimately failed for a few years, failed after a few years due to a variety of factors. But due to time constraints, that's a part of the story that's going to have to wait for another time. And so I'd like to conclude this talk by simply saying that the southward shift in membership of Christianity over the last century has had enduring consequences. That is, whether we're talking about Pope Francis's environmental agenda or the way in which the United Methodist Church recently tightened its ban on same-sex marriage and gay clergy. And Mormonism as a religious tradition is not immune from these changes. As I've shown here today, engagement with the non-Western world 
and Nigeria in particular, has contributed to the making of modern Mormonism by making it less distinctive. And it seems likely that the global South will continue to define the contours of Mormonism in the future as it becomes an increasingly international religious tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Dima, for sharing your research with us this evening. I should mention to our audience members, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, I encourage you to check out Dima's article entitled Gobert Edith and the Entry of the RLDS Church into Southeastern Nigeria, 1962 to 1966. You will find his article in the October 2019 issue of the Journal of Mormon History. It's literally an award-winning article. It's good stuff. I encourage you to read it. I'd like to share with you a video that Apostle Bunda Chibwe shared with us recently. The video was captured during the 2016 Nigeria Mission Center Conference at the Ikut Oku Mafang Congregation. It includes members of the church singing the historic hymn, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning, in their native language of Ifik. <laughs> Understanding of our church history in southeastern Nigeria. Thanks, Barbara. Um, also, thank you to Megan and Peter for helping co-host and for managing everything behind the scenes. Lastly, we share our thanks to you, our friends in the audience, uh, for your love of Community of Christ history and for generously supporting the historic sites with your donation. Thank you all for your support. I encourage you to tune in next week as we explore community of Christ history in the Holy Land. So be sure to register for next week's lecture. We will close this evening with another video from Nigeria. This video features the choir from the Abak congregation located next to Iko Okumafang in Akwa Ibom State, Nigeria. The choir is also singing the spirit of God like a fire is burning in Efik. In addition to the beautiful music from the choir, I highlight, a highlight of the video is seeing the choir members' clothing. You will notice the clothing material features the familiar Community of Christ peace symbol and images of the temple. It's a, a material culture study waiting to happen. We greatly appreciate that Bunda Chibwe shared this second video with us tonight as well. Thank you so much, Bunda. And once again, thank you, Dima, for sharing your research with us. You've given us a lot to think about. Well, everyone, until next time, take care, keep reading your church history, and have a blessed night. Mm -hmm.